stand up part of my talk is over. I'll, I'll move on. Um, cool. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about a, a pretty different um, sort of view of productivity. Um, I, uh, I'm a CTO. I guess that's clear from my slide. Um, we're a di pretty different company in terms of growth stage. Um, so pretty different set of concerns, I think. Um, you know, back in that, I think we're still in the back in the, like it wasn't always this way part of that growth phase. It's like, it's just all pain and misery. Um, but we're trying to work our way out of it. And so uh, I'm happy to tell you, that's my favorite part of these things is talking about your pain and misery, right? So um, ubiquitous language. I think that, to be clear, this title selection, actually, I'm going to go back to it so that everyone can read it again, even though it's been up here for five minutes. This title selection is very specific. Um, because I, th I think the words do matter. So you can learn a lot just from reading this title if you know where these words come from, right? So if you have studied DDD at all, if you're a DDD proponent, then you know that when I'm talking about ubiquitous language, I'm talking about the way that Eric Evans thinks about stuff. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, using the same words from top to bottom of your stack, every way, all the way out to the customer and all the way down to your, to your code, right? And if you happen to have studied agile methods, you might recognize that we're a Kanban shop and we're not a scrum shop because we talk about throughput and we don't talk about velocity, right? Uh, and if you speak English, <laughs> you'll know that I'm relating these two things. Uh, so words matter uh, and your selection of words matters. But what's really interesting about those things in each of those cases, I said, if you have this background, then you'll know what this means, right? But if you don't, that, I mean, you could just make up what this talk is about. You have no idea, right? And so coming to common understanding of the words that we're using is extremely valuable for all of us as an organization. I talked about being at a, at a very different point in growth, right? I would say that as, as a company, certainly as, as a technology stack, as a company, we don't have scale problems. We have scaling problems. Every week we have a different number of engineers than we had last week. A bunch, bunch of new people on the team, bunch of new faces, bunch of new problems, right? And different sizes. And as we've, as we've gone through that, we've really experienced changes in how we need to think about um, our engineering. So this, this actually, this point might be a little bit, words really matter as you scale almost uh, more than they do at scale, right? Often when you've reached a certain point, you've sort of figured these things out, but we're going through that transition and really experiencing some of that pain. So um, I've been a CTO on and off for about, 11 years. Um, and uh, my, my background as a CTO involves a lot of three person companies, five person companies. Um, so we're about, we just broke 150 as a company. Um, our engineering team is um, between 50 and 60, depending on how you, you know, who you include in the bucket. Um, and so it's, it's for me also going through that scaling uh, uh, process, right? Um, basically means that every day, I'm completely inexperienced to be able to do my job, uh, which is awesome. So uh, I have, this is like my bucket list of things I think you should be doing as a, as a CTO. Um, you know, hiring great engineers always seem like it would be part of the job description. Defining some high level direction, making some really important technical decisions, and of course, pulling crazy all-nighters to rewrite really hard parts of your code um, in C, because it's still my favorite language to program in. Um, picking words never really seemed like it was gonna make it on the list. Uh, it sort of felt like that just wasn't really going to be that important. So how do we end up in this place? Um, so Circle CI, for those who don't know, we were founded in 2012. Uh, things were a little bit different back then. Um, Ruby and Python apps were lit. We wouldn't have called them lit in 2012, and we wouldn't have had a cool emoji to express that. But we thought they were great, right? We were super stoked about monoliths. Uh, we were super stoked about... Oh, certainly we hadn't headed down the path of, of microservices. Docker was nowhere to be found. Um, well, it was probably, probably somewhere, but no one knew what that was supposed to be. Uh, and of course, I mean, iPhone headphones were totally round. Remember that? I mean, they're still crap, but they were crappy and round back then. So a lot of things change. I apologize for this slide. It's kind of become a meme now. I used it in a different talk and everyone thought it was really hilarious. So now it's like in all my talks, even though it's totally ridiculous and doesn't mean anything. Uh, and now I like to joke though that, that every, like every before and after slide, and you, you alluded to this a little bit, the monolith 
should also be in the after slide. Like the monolith never goes away. You just add a bunch of little services around it, right? Uh, we were once a, a Mongo shop. Now we call ourselves a Postgres shop, except we have like a few tiny little Postgres databases and these massive, massive Mongo databases, right? We just don't put more stuff in there now, but they're, they're going to be around. They're going to be around forever. But as we've scaled as a company, you know, we've run into, we've run into issues. We've, we've run into operational issues uh, where moving uh, or, or where having, you know, a single piece of code deployed in, in a bunch of different ways wasn't really useful for us. Um, we've run into just team scaling issues, right? The ability to work in, um, you know, independently or autonomously as, in, as separate teams instead of everybody working on the same code base. Uh, and that's, that's what you go through as you go from, when, when I joined the company um, in 2014, we were about 20 people as a company, uh, entirely engineers. Uh, so we've gone through a lot of change since then. Uh, and how we build software has changed pretty significantly. And this is actually uh, kind of related to what you were talking about. This is, this is from a different talk where I was talking about the shared code that exists between all these microservices, all the repetitive stuff that you do as you break out, right? So, um, so conveniently, actually going back to my previous slide where I check off like really good high level direction, we had this monolith, things were breaking, and my really good high level direction was we should probably build some microservices. So we got what you get when that's your direction, right? Which is just complete chaos. Like everything is built totally differently. We, we sort of had some, some consistency, like we're, we're a closure shop. Uh, so about 90, 90 to 95% of our code is written in closure. As we broke things out into services, we still, we still wrote them in closure, but almost every service was, I, I like this HTTP stack better than that HTTP stack. So it's like, we're so close to being consistent, but we still did all of these different things, right? And so, uh, so things started to slow down, right? As we're building, because now we're built, we've added all this kind of unnecessary complexity to our stack. So how do you fix that? Just add a pile of people. That'll solve everything, right? So now, instead of having a 20-person team where everybody understands everything, you've got like 50 or 60 engineers, and literally nobody knows what anybody else is doing, right? So, um, well, it was, it was a little bit funky. Uh, there were some challenges. Definitely productivity was approaching zero, if not going backwards. So... Um, I recognized part of this failing and decided, you know what we need is we need some consistent architectural values, some approaches, and we are going to, you know, we're going to get together. We're going to take the senior engineers and our team. We're going to get them together actually uh, here in San Francisco. This was the beginning of, um, of this year. And, uh, and what we'll do is we'll get together and we'll discuss architectural patterns that we want to adopt. So we have some consistency across our application. Right. And again, that was, both values and approaches. So I thought we were going to get together and discuss things like um, event-driven architecture, right? How can we apply this to get better decoupling between our systems, more autonomy on teams, be less concerned about how, you know, the pieces that are talking to each other, uh, as well as some, some values. And so I wrote, I wrote a document that was longer than this one, don't worry, um, that, uh, that had architectural values in it. But one of, the one of the interesting ones was canonicalize at the edges. So we, uh, as a CI provider, we talk to a lot of external systems, as you would imagine. We get data from GitHub. We get our entire representation of organizational model from, uh, from GitHub or Bitbucket. Um, and then we talk to downstream systems, et cetera, uh, in terms of deploy. And we had, over time, um, partly based on sort of early decisions, but we had carried forward a lot of those early decisions, brought those representations deep into our product. Right, so the representation of what is an org, what is a user, what is a repo, et cetera, was really reflective of GitHub. And we were actually GitHub first. And when we added Bitbucket, we ended up just making Bitbucket look like GitHub uh, as opposed to having our own sort of canonical representation, right? So I said, we should probably do something differently. This doesn't feel quite right. Like we've brought all of this uh, into our system. And uh, uh, Pavel, one of the engineers who was gonna be coming to this uh, and so was reviewing these, left this comment, not today, it was, it was today back then, uh, saying, oh, it sounds like what you want to use here is an anti-corruption layer. And obviously I thought, hmm, what's this guy talking about? Uh, but of course I didn't actually hit reply here. I did what every sort of senior engineer is do, would do, which is go Google it. 
and uh, try to figure out what he's talking about on my own. And, uh, and so I discovered the entire world of domain-driven design, right? So for those who don't know, anti-corruption layer is a term out of domain-driven design as well, uh, referring in just very specific words to refer to the notion of this, you know, canonicalizing at the edges. Create a layer that prevents the, uh, the data model of another system from creeping into your data model and make sure that what's represented inside your da data model or domain model is truly representative of your, of your domain and what you're trying to build. So um, the only unfortunate thing here is this was on Sunday afternoon for a summit that was starting on Monday for which I had great plans of all the things we were going to discuss. Um, I, who here has read uh, DDD, Eric Evans' book? Or any of the other ones? Uh, so I, I was like, so um, Vaughn Vernon or Vernon Vaughn, I can never get that right. He wrote another book called uh, Implementing Domain Driven Design. And I had heard that DDD was a slog and it was five o'clock on a Sunday. And DDD is like a 700 page book or something like that. So I was like, okay, I'll read this other 700 page book because I'll clearly get through that this evening. Uh, so I actually, uh, I didn't really give much of an intro. I have a degree in engineering physics. So I didn't study computer science. Um, and I, I can't say that I've done anything useful with engineering physics in my time since like, I graduated and went straight into software. But the one thing that I always say that I learned out of that was how to consume insane amounts of really complex material the night before an exam. Uh, because I never had a clue what was happening. And I literally would have 12 hours to figure out an entire subject matter. So luckily that was super helpful under these circumstances. So I read this book. I, it was very interesting. There's a ton of great content in that book, by the way, again, implementing domain driven design or the original one, domain driven design. Um, maybe like 40 solid pages worth of content in a 700 page book. And, um, but it's really, it's really hard to present. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to do this. Have, has anyone tried to define like a grammar? It's really hard to build from nothing. Right. So that's one of the key challenges in this, in this is, is like, I need to get all of these words into your head, all of which relate to other things so that you can then reason about them. But I don't know which one to introduce first because that's already dependent on one of the other ones, right? So this is, it's tough for going, basically. For anyone who's read it, I'm kind of sounding like I'm recommending against, but you need this information is all I can tell you. Like I've tried to distill it down. I don't know how. I've read a number of people saying, oh, if you read... Um, Sam Newman's microservices book touches on bounded context. That has all the good parts that you need from domain-driven design, complete lie. You will know nothing about domain-driven design if you read one of those books, unfortunately. So anyway, 12 hours later, um, I had learned some words to talk about words. So the best thing about domain-driven design is you're learning things like, like what is an anti-corruption layer? What is a bounded context? And now you have a framework with which you can actually start to talk about the words in your domain. What was really interesting to me about this, just as a side note, is this wasn't the first helpful framework that I consumed. I don't know these other books, if anybody's read any of them. Like I started programming in 98 and I think design patterns are like 94. I read that book and it totally changed my life, right? Because now I had like, do you, does anyone remember trying to explain a singleton before you knew what it was called? Like, okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna create a class, but then you're not gonna create another, or you're not gonna create another instance, which is gonna have one. How do I do that? Oh, well, you create this private constructor and then we'll call this like factory method. It's, oh, a singleton? Like, what are you talking about? Go read this book. Okay, so you read that book. And then after that, you're like, oh, we're gonna do factory pattern this and template pattern that. Like, there were so many conversations you could stop having. It was fantastic, right? Lean startup, same thing. I mean, I don't know that. I think now we're at the stage where no one's read it, but they just talk about MVPs. Nobody knows what an MVP really is, but. <laughs> They just keep talking about it, right? And everyone's like, yeah, MVP, totally, let's build one. They're like, great, I'll be back in 12 months. You're like, ah, I don't know if you understand what we're talking about. You keep using that word. Um, anyway, so this is what our meeting actually ended up looking like. Um, and what was really interesting about this, so th this was uh, a particular, in fact, speaking of the evolution of DDD, uh, Eric Evans didn't talk about um, event storming which is a method of basically like breaking down your application by brainstorming out all of the events that occur inside of your system uh, and sort of giving names to them and identifying them. Uh, it's something that was, I don't remember who created it, but someone created it separately and then it's sort of covered in some of these later books. 
But we went through this exercise in this lovely conference room that you can just see down here. What was amazing about this was the number of people in this conversation saying, our system does that? Wait, no, no, that's not what a build is. Or that's not what a, I, I mean, build, we'll come back to that later, but like literally pretty important words, right? Uh, like we're a CI and CD platform. So the, just recognizing, okay, we probably shouldn't be having a conversation about gRPC right now. Like we as a team cannot collectively agree on what it is that we have built. And this is what happened. I mean, we went from a 1.0 platform to a 2.0 platform. We introduced workflows on top of builds. We had gone through a lot of sort of organic change over time, but because this framework wasn't in place already, we had just jammed stuff on top, right? And so what you end up with is layers of a system where you're doing mental translation all the time of like, oh, we call it this up in the product, you know, in terms of on the marketing site, it's this, in the user interface is this, down here in the system, it's this totally other thing. And someone has like, well, in enclosure, it's semicolon, semicolon, it's, but, you know, slash, slash, to do, rename all this stuff, right? And Git Blame says that was written in there like four years ago. <laughs> you know, like slash, slash, to do just means don't, it should be called don't do. Like literally never come back and fix this thing. Like make a JIRA ticket if you actually wanted to get done. So we spent a lot of time kind of going through this very high level stuff and starting to realize that we needed like a common, a common language and a common understanding for how we were talking about the pieces, um, the pieces that we were building. And so we went from, I, I don't know, everybody has been around kids. I don't know if everybody here has kids, probably not, but like you were a kid, you know some kids, you've been on a really long flight with some kids. We kind of went through this transition where like, like kids cry because they don't know how to explain the thing that is frustrating them, right? And apparently so do software engineers. Like we could not have useful constructive conversations about what we were building because we weren't using the same words, right? And so you would spend so much time building something and then building it incorrectly or just not understanding it or not understanding kind of the requirements or the, the capabilities or the whatever, whatever you're trying to express to the user. Um, and particularly architecture discussions, right? Like system level discussions where, um, you know, I, I can reflect back on even parts of that meeting where we would spend two hours. Um, has anyone ever been in an architecture discussion where people are really passionate about their opinion? Yeah, so we had some of those. And you'd get to the end of two hours and be like, wait, you're saying the same thing. You're actually screaming at each other when you hold the same opinion. You're just using different words to describe it. And that is not, not a good situation, right? So. We, we raise the level of sophistication in our communication to be able to say, okay, well, I don't know, you have to know what DDD is and some of these keywords to know an aggregate root is. But, you know, we understood how to organize specific uh, thinking, how to organize our specific notions of particular entities in our system and talk about them effectively. And the difference in, um, you know, this is not the kind of production level, like I'm getting code out the door uh, view of productivity, but in terms of, the overall conversations in our organization and our ability to succinctly get to the point so that we could go do the work and do the right work on the first pass instead of the third pass uh, was changed remarkably. Now, note this was the beginning. It wasn't like we had this one week meeting and now we're all amazing at this, um, but it was a good start. So I wanna show a couple of examples of things that actually came out of this um, that were super interesting. So one of the, um, one of the core concepts in, do, in domain-driven design is that you have an overall domain of your system and then you have subdomains. Um, and in particular, uh, all of these books are in, in domain-driven design in general. You talk about a core domain or maybe two, uh, supporting domains and then generic domains. And the core domain is your business, right? The thing that you get up every day and your customers pay you for, the thing that differentiates you from everybody else out there. Um, the supporting domains are generally related but not as specifically, well, they're, they're not core. Uh, and generic is as, just like it sounds, right? And if you look at the list on the left here as you break down our domain, plans and payments, like what system doesn't have, okay, well, there's some, but 
advertising based ones, which still have payments. So they're just for the advertisers. Everybody, I've concluded in this conversation that everybody has a plans and payment system. Like, and if you can go through this and label something as generic, that should be the little like thought bubble in your head or the little like chime that goes off that says, can we buy this somewhere? Like, why are we building this? Why do we have a huge engineering team that's building this thing? Like plans and payments has been done, right? Of course, come on, who here has their own plans and payment system that they built? Because your thing's just a little bit different, right? There's always a reason. But even if you can put that little bit, you put 10% on top of someone else's system, you get 90%, right? Identities and permissions, operation is the actual operation of our system. So we, we have a, a cloud environment. We also sell a server product. So there's tooling that we use that we also give to our, our server operators. Um, workflow coordination is really the core of what we do, right? We take collections of work and we drive them through a system, right? And we support that with job execution, which is making sure that physical platforms are available and that they're allocated to the right, system, to the right jobs, et cetera. But uh, insights, you know, it's useful, like post analysis of, of data. Uh, but again, post processing, like collecting logs and streaming it to a browser. I mean, this is, this is a solved problem, right? Like taking data and streaming it out to a browser. But what's fascinating about this is I almost felt like I was offending people the first time we actually sat down and wrote this down. Like, I know you're on the identities and permissions team, but that's not actually the core of our business. People are like, what? Oh, you lied to me. It's, but this is really interesting because you should think about, like, I, I don't know if anyone here has these choices and what they do, but like the core of your, if you don't have your best engineering team and all of your extra budget allocated to fixing the core of your system, then maybe you're making some poor decisions, right? So going through this process and isolating this out is, is very valuable. Um, and this is pretty light on sort of breaking down the language, but just using these terms is really valuable. And then saying, hey, I'm on a team that's responsible for identities and permissions. And, you know, I'm really pissed that Rob called it generic, but I know what I do, right? I, I know the domain within which I work. Um, and then as you go back and look at like, hey, I'm building this service. Well, where are the boundaries of this service? Well, it should fit inside this domain, right? It shouldn't span a bunch of different parts of what we do. So this is a little bit more complex and again, still very specific to what we do, but um, this is a context map. So in, again, in the, in the DDD sort of language, you take um, your domains, your subdomains, which is considered the problem space, and then map it into your solution space, right? Into areas of work, which are referred to as bounded contexts. Um, and I think we're all familiar with the word context and probably boundary, hopefully. <laughs> we're all working in software, it'd be super great if we knew about boundaries. Um, and isolate that. But what's interesting here is these are, not, these are not services, they're not specific systems talking to each other. But as a new developer engineer at CircleCI, or someone who is trying to do some work on, this is, this is specifically related to effectively a job coming or a workflow coming into our system and getting executed. I can look at this and understand how the context that I work in, like maybe I work in workflow coordination, relates to the other ones that are out there and understand when I need to go talk to somebody. And I'm, of course, this is an API call. I don't actually call someone and say, hey, can you, can you run this? But where I touch other systems and then where I don't, right? What's constrained to what I work on and what is related to what other people work on. And specifically, I'm going to stop using this example because we, before we developed ubiquitous language, we decided to name something in our product contexts. And now we're all very sad. <laughs> this is a very useful word in other parts of your language. Never call something in your system a context. Unless it's like CTX, you know, when you're passing like the void star into a C. I'm going to keep jamming in the C references. Okay. Uh, but understanding like this context is called workflow coordination. This is job execution. When we went through this exercise, we didn't have build ingestion. It was, it was just kind of jammed into some other things. And then we said, oh, we're, so we're adding some new capabilities to, the, to our, our platform around um, converting configuration, which ha is not a responsibility of coordinating workflows. Like this is a, this is a, uh, it's a state machine. That's it. It just understands I have this work to do and I've, I've handed it out and I've gotten back state and I just adjust. And I, so where does that belong? Well, we're clearly missing a whole area of our product and we've got these capabilities just 
stuffed into other places, right? And now when you go to work on something, because you've taken what is a core function and just jammed it into other parts of your system, the cost of change is really high, right? Because you have to go and touch three or four different contexts, which means three or four different teams to get a feature implemented that should be consolidated in one place, right? So the exercise of going through and saying, what are the entities in our system? What do we call them? How do we talk about them? And then how do we group them together? And what works together as one system has really allowed us to then do effective work in the sense of going and implementing because the work is isolated to a particular area. Does that make sense? All right, I'm gonna move on from this map. Okay, so some key takeaways from this process. Number one, I don't know if you can see how bold that is. Don't, do not fight your users on words. So I talked about builds earlier and people fighting over what it means to have a build. So in CircleCI 1.0, there was only builds, right? You had a set of steps and that was a build and they ran sequentially or maybe the whole thing ran in parallel. And then we introduced this concept of workflows, which was you could define a DAG and say, when this one thing happens, then these three things happen. And if they're all successful, then this one thing happens, you know, fan out, fan in, like pipelines, people are familiar with this concept. And we said, oh, you know what's, what would be really smart? We have workflows and they have jobs and they have steps. So let's remove the word build because that refers to 1.0 from our language. That'll be really great. The only, it's one small problem. Everybody on the planet calls what we do a build. You can't take that away. You cannot argue with... 7 billion people. Okay, but not all 7 billion people use CI. We're on our way. I feel good about that. But you, you can't change the way that people talk about core concepts. So that, and what's better, in order to get workflows out the door, we took our original concept of a build, which was very linear, and used that as the basis to build jobs, which was a part of a workflow. So to the public and in the user interface, in most places, we had a job, but in our database and in our code, we had a build. And then in some parts of the user interface, it was also still called a build. So you're like, is this a job or a build? I don't really know. I'm looking at Litner like, say this because I know he's like, yep, I was there. So this is madness, right? Your customers are confused. Your developers are confused. Everything is overhead, right? A customer is like, hey, my build's broken. You're like, oh, is it? Or is your job broken? Or is your workflow broken? You're like, I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. So so much overhead. We love the expression cognitive load, right? We use it all the time. It's crazy. We're like buried just trying to talk about our, nobody's even written any code yet. We're just, we cannot even think about what we're building. So recognize how the entire market talks about what you do and embrace it. There's no other way. Do, however, fight your partners. So this goes back to the GitHub thing. Like we took all of GitHub's language and just smeared it through all of our code. I love GitHub. They're awesome. They do amazing things. We couldn't exist without them. But that doesn't mean that their org model should be our org model or that everything they call something is something that we should call something, right? We need to stand up on our own and represent our domain and then adapt to their domain. So going back to that anti-corruption layer, use that to translate between one system and your system, right? Make sure that you truly own your domain model and that you can speak about it coherently and push all that stuff out to the edge. The other great thing about that is one team, you know, working at that boundary can worry about what that translation means. Everybody else inside is just talking about your domain model, right? That's how your APIs work. It's how your conversations work. And then finally, Invest in bringing your team along. Again, I'm not sure how much this affects everybody else here, but um, I'm a little bit impatient. I mean, I just talked about reading a 700-page book in like four hours or eight hours or whatever it was because I was like, I got to get this done. Oh, we got to do domain-driven design. Let's learn tonight. It's Sunday night. And so I showed up on Monday morning. I was like, great. Let's go, people. We're doing domain-driven design. They're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, didn't, you didn't read this book last night? Here, let me give you a quick primer. I made a five slide deck. Boom, boom, boom. Like, here's the name of these terms, five pages. Everybody good? No, I don't know what you're talking about still. 
And so there was this kind of like, oh, we got to get going. We got to get going. And people were like, I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. And so we really had to uh, invest. And there were some, um, some ideas that came up that at first I was like, that's pretty crazy. And then we did them. So we had a, like a Friday book club, right? We also found a shorter book, uh, <laughs> which is super great. Uh, we, read, we all read a book called uh, Domain Modeling Made Functional. Uh, which is interesting because it's all in F sharp and none of us know anything about F sharp, but like you can carry over the concepts, right? And the first part of the book does a really great job of talking about domain driven design and establishing the concepts. And then it goes into how to implement it in your systems. I will comment that there are a couple of throwaway paragraphs where I was like that paragraph right there, there are entire volumes written on that little thing that he just kind of like threw you know, like, Oh, and also you should do hexagonal architecture next, like just moves on. You're like, Oh, Actually, if everyone could go do a little work on that, that would be really great. But, um, you know, chapter by chapter, having that conversation, like how does this apply to our system? These are the concepts that we're trying to work through. Do people get those? Can we talk about them? Do people like really understand it? Because one thing, now it's kind of funny actually, because I was like anti-book club. And now every time I'm reading a book, I'm like, I want to start a book club. I want to talk to people about this. Like I'm learning really cool stuff, right? I'm reading a book right now on the power of habit. Anybody want to join a book club and talk about the power of habit? Let's do it. It was, it's really cool. And I just, I want to chat about it. Right. It's, it's, and it sinks in when you're like, I have a deadline. I'm going to read this chapter. We're going to get together. We're going to talk about it. We're going to take notes and people get different things out of the book that you missed or that didn't really occur to you. It's awesome. Super fun, but it's really time consuming. Um, so that was one thing. And then we, uh, we set up like a, a Wednesday morning domain modeling meeting where we would just take a part of our product and break it down into pieces and like everyone could come and like, it's really weird to schedule a meeting of 50 people to have a working session. Like whatever, that's meeting one-on-one, never do this. Right. But, uh, it was a, it was a good conversation and people would come and some people would have knowledge of that particular part. Other people would have interesting questions because they would be like, you've been working on that for four years and that's ingrained in your, in your head, but that makes no sense. Like what you just said is insane. People would be like, yeah, now that I think about it, that is pretty insane. So let's like, let's make some notes and think about how we should talk about this part of the system. Right. And, uh, and then some people just watched, you know, like, Oh, it's interesting to kind of watch people go through this process and learn. And like, as a junior engineer, we were talking about junior engineers earlier, like you might not be able to come to that, that meeting and, and like have a really high level conversation about designing a system. But once you've seen it done a bunch of times, rather than, Hey, we went and had a meeting and we wrote all this stuff down. You should read this document. Um, then you're going to start to bring stuff to the table, right? And there's always fresh ideas. So uh, you really have to make an investment in the team. But in my mind, it's, it's absolutely worth it. So yeah, this is my like, if I can go back and visit myself. Uh, I've been here for four years, minus a month, Circle CI. Um, a lot has changed over that time. And, you know, three and a half years in, we started having this conversation about like, how, what are we building? which seems insane because at some point, like this is true in all startups, right? You're just off to the races. You're like, oh, I don't even know what we're building. I don't care. We just got to like pivot, 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 try this, try that. You're all over the place. You have this weird technical debt of like, remember when we were a marketplace, but now we're a developer tools company. Like, don't worry about that thing. It just like sits in the corner, but user IDs don't work if we don't have it. So just ignore it. Like if you don't start out with that understanding early and kind of drive it through, then you're going to have to retrofit it later and retrofitting it is really expensive. And having it super early is crazy cheap. Like, I love telling stories where I'm like, the next time I start a company, I'm like, there's no way. I don't have it in me anymore. But if I were to start another company, I would start here. I would just be like, what are we building? What is this thing? What is this thing? And you, you can change it. It's really cheap to change, right? It's just like a document, basically. Although ultimately, it's throughout your code. But, you know, your code is probably pretty light in the early days. But when like one day you decided to call it this thing and then the next day over in this file, you decided to call it something else, like that happens really early and it gets really expensive over time, right? You get that new engineer in who's like, can anyone tell me where the user is in this part of the code? You're like, oh, that's the actor. What? Why are they called an actor over here? Uh, that, was, that was Jeff. He just liked that word. You know, like getting that out early, just it, the, the potential for leverage out of it is, is huge. All right, that's all I got. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. 
Uh, that's really, I think we're recording, so I'm going to repeat your question, even though you're like 10 feet from me. So the question is, what kind of success have we had in exporting our language from engineering to other functions? Um, it's kind of gone both ways. Uh, and so if you, um, if you re I haven't read all of the DD books, <laughs> that would be completely nuts. Uh, but in the literature, uh, there's a lot of discussion of making sure you have the stakeholders at the table as you define your, uh, your language, right? So you don't want to have it be an engineering driven effort. I kind of skipped over that part. So there was at the same time that we were here, a lot of our product management team was in town. Most of them are in town anyway, but others were in town. And we got together and spent time working through like, okay, this part of the product, like especially there, there are parts of the system that they care a lot about users and organizations and accounts. And what does that mean? And how do they relate to each other? And having a really clear shared understanding of that is super, super valuable and presenting that to your, to your users, to your potential customers, documentation, marketing materials, user interface, all of it. If it doesn't line up, like every translation that you have to make somewhere in the way there is painful. And well, I mean, don't get me wrong. We have lots of them, especially down in like the kind of innards of our database. Like certainly, you know, I, let's just rename all the columns in a 12 terabyte Mongo system. Like, sorry, columns. <laughs> uh, um, we'll rename like a collection or a field or whatever. That's like a, a copy, right? You're just never doing it. So you just accept that. But we try to push the... Um, the translation layer as close to the kind of the broken thing as we can, right? Like down in the, uh, down in the access to the database, we'll start calling it the right thing right away so that we've pushed down that knowledge. And then there's that little, it's kind of like anti-corruption layer on your own systems, but then going the other direction up into marketing, like we have these conversations with product marketing, with product management, like how are we going to refer to this entity in our system? How do we want to talk to users about it? Um, so that we can then represent that in our system in the same way. Uh, and when everyone is using that same language, um, this, uh, this reduces, you know, room for error, cognitive load, just like the overhead of all that, all that translation. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I think I've said this in many talks that I've given. I forgot to mention it here. Like I love talks because we're all in blog posts and whatever, because we're all really good at talking about like the end state as if we're perfect. Like we kind of ignore all of the pain that we went through to get there. Um, sorry, I'm going to repeat your question also, which was just how do we maintain the discipline uh, and these principles as we grow and evolve the, the platform? So um, yes, in an ideal world, um, have things like, and we're still working on the documentation, like that context map that I was showing you, right? To be able to say, here's how these different contexts interact. And then a level down from that, within this context, these are the entities that we reference. So that when someone comes along, it's not like, I'm going to go read some code and, uh, and just start jamming stuff in. It's like, oh, I can think about or reason about, like, what is the structure of this bounded context? Is all of my work inside this bounded context? Or am I talking to another one? And then that also illuminates to me who needs to be involved in the conversation. If everything is constrained within this bounded context, that's probably a team in an ideal world. And so we can just have that conversation and move on. If the thing we're doing is, is either drawing on or impacting another bounded context, then we should go have a quick chat and make a decision about how we're extending that. Um, and, then, and then maybe we'll add it to that document. Again, it depends on, on how high up it's, it's um, bubbling, if you will. Uh, but it should be the case that within a bounded context or a subdomain, you know, you can work pretty independently, right? Um, and again, part of defining those is making sure that they are defined in such a way that you can work independently, right? If, um, and, and we've run into this, we've broken up, I would say before we had a clear picture of, um, of these contexts and a little bit after, I mean, it takes work. Some of these problems are hard. We've, we've created capabilities that really span contexts and then you feel it. As soon as you try to do the work, you're like, oh, I have this JIRA ticket, but it's blocked by that one that the other team needs to implement, but they've got some other priority right now. So we're waiting for that. Um, and that really, so we've also just evolved in terms of like, actually that was a mistake. And we need to sit and think about how we can restructure this software so that everything is self-contained or 
if we have shared systems and those kinds of dependencies, how can we better architect those systems? Meaning this thing should be configuration driven because every team has a dependency on it. Like, like uh, permissions is one of those things, right? That like, I need permissions, but I don't want to have every team build its own permissions capabilities. I want to have centralized permissions. So how do we make permissions very configurable so that someone can come along and say, oh, here's a new permission that I need to store. Please store this for me. And then we come back and check if it's valid for that user versus that being in code somewhere. And then, you know, every team, I think you were talking, um, I forget this, the API gateway system, but like everyone coming along and saying, hey, I wrote a PR for you. Uh, you're going to love it. I don't love it. You know, like that, that whole thread. Yeah. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is impact of moving to, I'm going to call it towards DDD on the organization. Um, yes, so I mean, cognitive load is part of it. I, would, I think that's like, as an individual developer, I need to maintain like this translation layer and all these things. But then also just our ability to have sane conversations, right? Where I'm like, hey, I, you know, I need to do this thing with the build. And you're like, oh, the build or the job or the workflow? Like, which one are you talking about, right? And so um, we actually, in our code base in some places now, have like new build and build classic. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, because <clears throat> in here, like, I have to know that it's the old one, whatever. So, but, but just honestly, putting that out there has changed the shape of conversations. Um, and it is that we have defined like our language, Right, so we we've said, okay, this is what this entity means, and it might be, um, you know, when we talk about bounded context. I didn't really go into this, but um, it doesn't have to be exactly the same in each of those contexts. You wouldn't call a user in one a build in another, but a user here, like in a a billing system, is a different representation of that user than it is in a permission system, right? So, and and one of the kind of common anti-patterns I think in microservices is like the user service. Like everything to do with users is going to be over here in this thing. You're like, okay, so it's a column in a, or like a table in a database, right? It's like things about users that have to do with billing are over in the billing system and things about users that have to do with access to code are over in like a permission system, right? And so recognizing, I, I, that was actually one of the key drivers was recognizing what it may, what it means to be a bounded context and what sorts of things go together in a bounded context have then changed the way that we think about building services. Because I will like the notion that I'm going to build a service that spans three of these things feels really broken right out of the gate. But if I don't have those boundaries and those lines, then I'm like, I don't know, user service sounds good, right? Like it, I keep joking about the user service, but everyone's seen one, right? So it's like, being able to then say, oh, I can't build this thing because it's going to cross this boundary. Or again, going back to permissions, I was talking about that, or like we have an API gateway also, right? I mean, my, my end consumers of the API don't give a crap about my bounded context and my like service infrastructure, right? They want one destination to send all their API calls to. But then we think about that very clearly in terms of okay, how are we going to architect this thing in a way that we can all work on it or get work done uh, and not just be like, ah, oh, giant shared code base will be great and we'll just deal with it down the road and like different people will implement different parts in different ways and no one will be able to make sense of it anymore. So um, I would say from a, like, again, just bounded context model, it's really driven how we think about building systems uh, and building services, which has been really positive um, because we felt the pain of building them poorly before. And then... Um, I think the language thing in particular has, has really connected kind of how you think about code to how you think about users. Like they were a little bit distant before because down here I'm thinking about the machine and up here I'm thinking about like user interaction. And so representing that the same way all the way through kind of 
it just kind of mentally connects you to, you know, the end user and what they're trying to do and what they're trying to achieve. That's a little bit fuzzy. Like I certainly couldn't put metrics on that one, but I, I do think that that uh, is, is really beneficial in, you know, in kind of getting to product thinking. Does that make sense? Yeah, so have we reorganized in teams and services as a result of this? So this is kind of funny because we had just reorganized teams, but it's, it's a bit like the canonicalizing at the edges, like that statement in that that made sense. We just weren't using the domain-driven design word for it. Like we, we didn't call it an anti-corruption layer, right? Like we're like, hey, take this thing. It's kind of like the like, hey, make this class, but only have one instance of it, whatever. It was like, take this thing and make sure there's like a sane single representation of it that we all understand. So we had just reorganized our teams. And then when we drew our bounded context, it proved out that the teams that we had created were well aligned with the bounded context that we then unveiled. But that explained why some, it wasn't clear where services landed in particular teams because the services weren't well split across those boundaries, right? We had some services that just were like, had roles that spanned them and didn't make a ton of sense. So there was probably more service shifting than there was team, uh, team shifting. That makes sense. Yeah, sh shifting more, uh, uh, yeah, there was shifting work out of some, uh, combining some, uh, it was just like, what, this is a complicated mess and it all does this one thing. Like, why do we have these different pieces? Um, deciding not to do things like we had plans to add things to certain services, but then saying, okay, well now it's creating this shared thing where the sharing is less value because it's going to break down the autonomy between these teams. Um, so there are a few, a few different impacts for sure, but mostly on the architectural side, organizationally, we just happen to have been going in about the right direction. I, yeah, I'm totally here. I live here. Right. I mean, ish. So, uh, with Jim Cook running out of time, and I want to leave the time for the last speaker uh, announcement. But thank you very much, Rob. That was an awesome yeah, talk. Welcome. I want to learn more about the team. Yeah, you're going to be able to. Thank you. Right on.